I have woken up with a spirit of gratefulness today. I am so thankful for my brothers and sisters. I am so thankful for this church. How many are thankful for this church, for SBCNY? I'm glad you are tuning in. Whoever is online right now, we are so grateful that you're tuning in today. We would like to see you here. So if you can, please make it to the church. We want to fellowship with you guys, come into the presence of the Lord together. It will be an amazing thing. I want to explain why I'm so thankful for this church because this church has been giving us this week so much. We have small groups on Tuesday. How many was to connect it with their small groups? Come on. So small groups, if you have not connected, you can still do it. 7.30 on Tuesdays. We have one on Thursday and we have another one on Saturday. So you can just uh, email me, Tony at SparrowBrotherhood.org, and I can definitely help you out and plug you into a small group. We also have brotherhood and sisterhood. Our pastors were leading that. It was an amazing experience last Thursday. We also have Bible study. If you have not plugged into Bible studies, come on, you got to do it. Every Friday at 8 p.m., you want to tune in with our brother Hoas, Benny Ascona, Alejandra. By the way, Alejandra is back. She just got married. We are so excited to have you and Juan in the house. Come on now. And last but not least, I am so thankful for our pastor, Anthony, because last week he brought a message, an amazing message, which was on the subject, take your position. And I love messages like that. Because when we take the position that God has designed for us to take, that is where we find our authority, and most importantly, we find our purpose. Just like a year has different seasons, so does our walk in this life. There are seasons of uh, joy, other seasons of sorrow, some seasons of victory. But I believe not just the church, but the entire world is in a season of warfare. We're living in a time in history where humanity is being attacked in all angles, from racism to financial to health with this pandemic, and even politics, the, war, the world is at war right now. Everyone is taking a stance. Everyone is fighting against something now more than ever. Knowing this, it is extremely important as the Church of Christ to take our position in this season, because by doing so, we will see God's hand moving in a powerful way. The last thing Satan wants for the church is to be a position in the place that God designed for them to be in. Amen? The problem is that some of us don't see ourselves in the position he wants to put us in and for, for this season. And most of us don't want to accept it. Therefore, we get into an unnecessary war with the creator. As if we know best. As if we know better than the one that designed us. As we can tell the sovereign God where we belong. For the next kind of, uh, uh, couple of minutes, I would like to take a few minutes and just talk about this subject, active faith. Let's go to Mark 2, verse 1 through 12. I am reading from the ESV version, for those who are wondering. Um, this story is an amazing story. It's one of my favorite. As a matter of fact, it's about a paralytic. There's two different paralytics, and one is one that was by the pool. He was trying to get a miracle. He didn't get the miracle, and God, Christ comes and speaks to him, and he gets him healed. This one, though, is more, to me, more interesting, and I'll explain as we go on. If you have it, say amen. amen. Mark 2, verse 1 through 12, it says, And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many, who is him? That's Jesus. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room. Say no more room. Come on, you can do better. Say no more room. Not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Say, say four men. Come on, better than that. Four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, say faith. faith. Come on, faith. faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit 
that they, that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the par paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went, went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Father God, Lord Jesus, I give you thanks for this moment once again, Lord God. Speak through me, Lord God. Bless your people. Prepare the hearts, Lord God, that this may fall on fertile ground. In Jesus' name, I pray. And the church says? And the church say? Yeah. Hebrews 11 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. We just read a passage in Scripture where we see many things happening all at once. Jesus decides to come into a house. A lot of people debate whether this was Peter's house or someone else's house. The point is that Jesus came to this house. He start, he's sitting there, and he is just deciding to have a conversation. When he decides to have a conversation with the scribes, or were there, the haters, you want to call them, they were just there because they were trying to look for a reason to, like always, trying to get at Jesus for something that he's saying wrong or he's doing something wrong. So they hear, they hear, I guess the town hears that Jesus is in town. So they all come in, they gather, they fill up the place full capacity. And we're going to have that in SBC NY soon. Where's the faith? We're going to have that in SBC NY soon. We're going to have that in SBC NY soon. Because Jesus is in the house. Every single service, Jesus is in the house. So here we are, and the house is full. And now we see, like always, when Jesus shows up, a miracle is about to break out. So four men shows up, obviously, just on cue, show up seeking for a way to get to the man who has been making things that were impossible possible. The problem is that the crowd is so crowded that they realize, um, like, like the woman or the issue of blood, um, we're not going to get through this one. The woman of issue of blood was able to get her way through the crowd. Now with this one, Papa, it's not happening. So they really, really had to figure out what they're going to do with this situation. Now, this leads me to my first point, and it is when opposition meets faith, it has no choice but to make a way. I'm going to repeat that for you. When opposition meets faith, true faith, it has no choice but to make a way. Moses was met by the Red Sea, and it had to make a way. King David was met, before he was King David, was met by a giant, and it lost its head. Here, here we see four men, and the story doesn't change, because when faith is upon someone, there's nothing that can stand away. So they realize, like, um, so how are we going to do this? And I can imagine how much they were thinking and exhausting all their options. Maybe si movemos a viejita de allí, podemos entrar. Maybe if I kick that little kid, maybe I get through there. No, no, let's not do that. Let's, let's think of something else. And I can just imagine, I can just get in the story and imagine what they were plotting and how they were going to do this. In the meantime, I want to, to, for you to remind, uh, remind you that these guys, these four guys, is holding a body. A paralytic body, it is heavy. It is not just a thing that you just hold, like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to move. No, nah, it wears on you. Anyone that goes to a gym and does farmer walk, that wears on your forehead. So you are holding him in this direction, and you are thinking of how am I going to get this guy in there with this crowd. The, the mentality of these men um, we're going to, say, we go, to get them to Jesus was, I'm going to get them to Jesus. I'm going to get this man to Jesus, or I'm going to get this man to Jesus. It wasn't, it wasn't like, mm, maybe we're not going to be able to do this. It was like, I'm going to get my friend, my buddy, my brother or sister. The Bible doesn't tell us who this paralytic man was to these four men, but it says that it, they have faith to get him to Jesus. So here we see the, the, the situation, and now we see that they realize like, oh, we're going to go up to the roof. Now, I want you to picture this because the more you study the Bible, you find funny things like, okay, this is me. I don't know about you guys, but if I'm the paralytic and I am laying on the floor 
and you say, we're going to take you up to the roof. This will be my response. A quien? Who are you taking to the roof? Hold up. You guys are already struggling over here because how long have you been holding me here? And now you most likely going to have to angle me to get me up or you're going to have to use ropes or somebody's going to stay in the bottom holding me up. I don't know how you're going to get me up there, but you're planning to get me up there. But one thing we notice about this paralytic is that he does not say a single thing. We hear about what the four men are doing, but we don't see anything coming out of this man. And it's funny because I believe that he also had a faith just as strong as the four men. He had such a, 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 a conviction and such a determination to get to Jesus that he said, I don't care what they pl plotting. Let it happen because if I just get to Jesus, my miracle would happen. This man could have easily said, let's just wait out here. Let's just wait for him to come out. The paralytic man could have said, nah, bro, y'all can leave me right here. And now nah, let's not do that nonsense that you're talking about, putting me in that roof. Like, how? What are you talking about? If you drop me, you could easily drop me right there and I, I die. You could have easily just dropped me right now because they can stop me to death when they decide to leave. Like, nah, we're not doing this whole thing of going up there. They, these five men, to me, were the embodiment, um, embodiment of what true faith is all about. Because they were all determined. They were all together to do this. He was, he was paralyzed. He wasn't, he wasn't muted. He could speak. He could have spoken and said, I'm not doing this. Yet he did not say anything. Which leads me to my second point, which is moving faith always grabs God's attention. All throughout the Bible, we see that when men move in faith, God's powers shows up. And this occasion, it wasn't any different because these men get to the roof and had the nerve and the courage to not care about the consequences. They didn't even know who owner is this house. Like, I don't know who it is, but we're going to the roof because we know Jesus is in there. So we're going to get into the, to, to the place. And I just want to say, God bless whoever house it is. Because I'm going to be transparent like I always am. And if I'm with in the, inside the house, I may, Jesus could be having the best service ever. I could be hallelujah, glory to Jesus. Oh, yeah, the power is coming out of your words because he was, he was preaching. And I could have been hallelujah. And all of a sudden, if I look up and this is my house and I start seeing dust coming down of my house. Oh, oh, we're having a problem. I would have been, the Bible would have said this. And Jesus broke up a fight before making the miracle. <laughs> because it would have gone down. And I don't care who's, how spiritual you are. Pastor Anthony, if somebody comes to your roof and they break in, I think the flesh will be stronger at that moment. And you will give in and most likely Jesus will have to intervene in our lives. Not for our sake, but for the people that was breaking the roof. And so we see this right now that they're not caring. They don't have a care in the world about who's the owner. And something that Luke tells us that Mark doesn't tell us is that before the men started plotting and doing all of this, it says that the spirit of God was upon Jesus to heal. I need you to understand that because Jesus was in the house preaching. He was not healing. Mark doesn't tell, tell us that Jesus was healing anybody. He was preaching, but yet Luke takes a moment and says, and the power of God was in Jesus to heal. What does that tell me? It tells me that Jesus was prepped for the, the miracle to happen for that person. I need you to understand that Jesus is in the business to see how much do you want the miracle. He is so, he is just a fan of you as he is, as you, as we are becoming a fan of him. He wants to see how bad do you want to get to me? How much you desire my presence? How much do you desire to get to where I'm at? How much do you want your miracle? And so he is preaching, dealing with the haters. Here we can see uh, these five men doing their thing, going up the roof. Jesus is fully aware. Side note, Jesus is funny. God is funny. Because I can imagine he must be laughing like, I don't know if the owner knows this. 
but there's five people just coming up, and they breaking and messing your house, but I'm going to stay quiet, and I'm going to keep on preaching because this is funny to me, and this is great to me, and I'm going to take glory out of this. So then we see these men, and then they create the hole. They bring down the paralytic on the foot of Jesus, and the next thing that we see happening is that Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And I want, I want you to understand what's happening because Jesus knows what this man is coming for. He was 100% God and 100% man. So he knows exactly that this man wants healing of the body. But Jesus does something different to initiate the encounter. Which leads me to my third point, and that is your faith in Jesus will provide more than what you thought you needed. You see, sometimes we come into an encounter with a circumstance and we start saying, I don't know why I'm going through this. I don't understand why it's taking so long for this to get out of my system, out of my life. This, this circumstance is beating me down, wearing me down. I cannot do this anymore. And God is asking for two things. And is that for you to keep on pressing forward? Keep on pressing forward. Keep on pressing forward and keep believing in me. Keep believing that if you get close to me, if you get my attention, I will make the miracle happen. But here it is, church. Here it is, church. Sometimes you go in for healing and God doesn't want to heal you in the physical. He wants to heal you internally. Jesus, he was more concerned about his soul than his physical body. He was so concerned that the moment he sees him, you got to see this, guys. They went above and beyond. They weren't just kidding around. They went up a roof. They did all they could to, and they broke down. They could have gone to jail. They could have gone. They, they didn't care of the crime that they were committing. All they cared was to get to Jesus because they knew if Jesus is there, he's the solution to all. I need a solution. I don't need a pastor. I need Jesus. I don't need a rabbi. I need Jesus. I don't need a president. I need Jesus. I don't need a financial help. I need Jesus. And Jesus was like, all you need is me. Stop thinking about what I need in the outer when all I care about is inside of you. Let me get inside of you. Let me get to you. Let me get to that issue first. So this is what happens. He, he's laying there. And I can imagine the paralytic, he was like, yeah, yeah. I'm about to get up. I'm going to start laying up, doing some jumpers. I'm going to dunk on somebody. I'm doing something today. I'm right here. I see you, Jesus. What up? Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And yet you don't hear the paralytic speak a thing. Who you hear is the people around. Because this is what happens when you're dealing with a, a, a situation Everybody think they should know what's best for you. And so they try to figure, to say to, to the men, who are you? First of all, I'm going to ask you, who are you to forgive sins? You're not God. What are you doing? And yet Jesus, they didn't even say it with their mouth. They're saying it with the heart. We have to be very careful about the things that we say in our hearts. Because we think nobody's hearing us. But let me tell you something. God sees all. You can fake it till you make it, but not to God. God is going to be like, oh, are you praising me? But do you forgive your brother? Oh, are you praising me? Do you forgive your sister? Oh, really? Do you? Because I can see your heart. And I think it is important for us to make a heart check daily. Now more than ever, we need to examine our hearts. Listen to me, church. If your heart is rotten, you not going anywhere. Salvation comes through faith in Jesus, but your heart has to be pure. Your heart has to be a forgetful heart. Your heart has to be a righteous heart. You cannot think that you're going to get to the pearly gates by serving every day and by being so welcoming to the people. And then your, what's in your heart is just poison. So he looks at the scribes and he says, what is easier to do? 
to tell this man to get up or to forgive him of his sin. And then this is what happens next. And this, that he then says, okay, I'm going to fix your legs. But I want you to also understand another part of this situation. Paralytic guy never said to Jesus, can you forgive me of my sins? Can I tell you, church, you didn't come to Christ. Christ called you out of the wilderness. You didn't come to Christ and said, forgive me of my sins. Yes, he showed up and you saw the truth. And the truth set you free. It was in that moment where Jesus was, I'm calling you, I'm calling you, and I'm calling you. We did not earn salvation. Salvation was given to us through grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. It was freely given to whom he ever chose to give it to. You did not cho choose salvation. And so didn't this man. This man didn't ask Jesus, give me uh, salvation. He was there for healing. And then Jesus was like, the first thing I'm going to do, call you mine. I'm going to make sure you understand that you are mine. I want you to embed it in your heart that I have called you for salvation. So it was an instant interaction of your mind. And we need to understand that God loves us. Some of us don't under, really understand that God really loves us. That Jesus, does, that God doesn't care how far you run, he's still going to find you. He's going to be like, you're mine. You're coming with me. You're in my, my hand. So I want to, to, to get you to understand, church, that God is calling us out. We need to activate our faith, not for us to perform the miracle, but to lead those to the one who can. He can do, he, he we can no longer be the crowd of spectators watching what miracle God can do next. And we cannot afford falling into the distraction that this world may bring because this world is in desperate need of a solution. The city is so desperate in need of a church who will be like these four men. I want you to understand this. We have this saying a lot, and you hear it in the church a lot, I'm cutting people. I'm cutting them from my life. Now, I don't want them in my life anymore. Can you understand? I wish I had four people, but I don't, I don't see four guys here. This guy was lame, and these guys was holding him to Jesus. They were carrying him to Jesus. And I can imagine that there were moments where they were getting tired. They were getting weary. I don't want to do this anymore. They probably, they, they could have been like, I don't want to keep on moving this person to Jesus and yet we see them that they kept on going and kept on going kept on believing how many of you have stopped believing in someone in your life how many of you lost hope for someone that was in your life and you was like oh, I don't got time for this so I'm just gonna let them go and God is like I had you in their life so that you could be the Christ in their life. Because they can't see me right now, so I need you to lead them to me. I need you to have faith in them, just like I have faith in you when you didn't know about me. You know that there is every day we have, and God, Jesus, have an opportunity to say, you know what, I'm tired of you. I'm done. And yet he chooses not to. If we are truly Christ followers, we have to be like Christ, church. We have to be able to have mercy and grace on people. We have to endure and have, and have the patience with them because they're all going through a process. And yes, sometimes it might get really heavy, but sometimes you just got to go on top of the roof and say, you know what, I'm going to carry you all the way through. I'm going to create a hole. I'm going to create an opportunity for you to meet Jesus at his feet. I'm going to make sure you meet him at the altar. I am not giving up on you. But we have a generation right now that is all concerned about me. You want to know what's true warfare? True warfare is all about making sure that your feelings doesn't beat you to the, to the determination and the, and, the, and the call that God has in your life. You know what is true warfare? Warfare is saying yes to the will of God and no to your feelings. Do you want to know what true warfare is all about? True warfare for us Christ followers is making sure that his name is known when the world wants to turn back and say, I'm either voting for the red or the blue. Who cares? It's Jesus and Jesus alone. If my trust is in Jesus, if my trust is in Jesus, whoever wins, his kingdom will still reign. 
It does not matter what happens. I, how dare us try to argue? Oh my God, I'm going to argue with a thousand people because I need them to understand why you should vote for this person. Like if God is not already in the throne. Like if God is not already ruling. Do you think anything happens that is not on his will? Everything happens the way he asks for it, the way he desires to be. His sovereignty, sovereignty always reigns. Yes, sir. Come on. Stop arguing with people. Stop telling them you have to do this. No. No, I, I don't waste time on arguing with people why you should vote for this person. You should definitely vote because we have to do it. But never waste your time. Um, arguments that has already been on the throne and on the cross it was put on display when Jesus said it was finished and he called himself the king of kings and the lord of lord he is sitting on the right on the right side of the, of the father there's no one greater than God and so his will will always be and will forever be the one that will take control the worship team could come up I want you to 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 I want to read these verses to you it says in John 13, 34 to 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciple if you have love for another. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, 4, 7, and I love it because people use this for marriage, like if it's only for marriage. This is not only for marriage. This is also for your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is also for that person that doesn't have it as strong as you. This is also for that person that really needs to know Jesus, and yet they have not had the opportunity to meet him. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 7. It says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. What does it say? It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bear all things, believes all things, hope all, thing, all things, endure all things. Church, you want to see change in your community? You want to see change in this country? You want to see change in the church? All you have to do is truly love and have faith in Jesus. When you activate your, your, your faith and, and love in Jesus, Everyone around you, love is contagious. Do you know that love is so contagious that when you truly are, are really loving people, they will gravitate to you. Do you know what's missing in this world? Is love. Every day is an agony for people to find love. And so they distract themselves with social media and they distract themselves with other things that are happening in the world because they are trying to find an escape to the havoc that they're li living in. And if the church rises up and be like these four men and decide to say, hey, you're going the wrong way. Or, hey, you cannot move. Let me help you to get to Jesus. We will start seeing change in our world. We will start seeing things happening that we never saw before. Because the Bible says that in the final days, the Holy Spirit will fall upon the people. From old people to the youngest. They will all feel the Holy Spirit. But something has to happen first, church. Something really has to happen. And it's that the church will take their position. They have to take the position that Christ has called, and called them to be. And that is to be love in the midst of hate. That's to be light in the midst of darkness. That's to, for you to be a solution instead of being more of a problem to those who are lost. You can start playing because I'm done. We need to be the solution. Let's stop being a problem. We need to genuinely love and care for people. The reason we do small groups and we do brotherhood is because we want to, for you to know that we care. Don't ever over-spiritualize things because sometimes we just want to go pray and God is asking us, talk. Let's talk with one another. Can I hear your heart? I care for you. I want to meet you where you are. I'm not perfect either. I want you to know this about me. I want to know, for you to know that although I'm a little ahead of you does not mean that I don't struggle. I still struggle. And that is okay because the perfect one is perfecting me each and every day. 
We need to understand that we will never be perfect until we get to heaven. But yet God is so graceful and so graceful that he made a community so that those who feel like I'm not worthy can tell them, yes, you are. You're so worthy. You are a worth, your worth is of a Christ who died on the cross and said, I love you. By, by extending his hands, by extend, giving, giving his body away silently, you have a father that loves you. Thank you for connecting with us at Spirit of Brotherhood Church. I pray that you were blessed and encouraged today. Our heart is for all people to have an encounter with God and for lives to be changed. If you're in need of prayer, send us an email to prayer at spiritofbrotherhood.org. We would love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, SBC TV, to stay connected. If you are grateful for this ministry and would like to help us continue spreading this good news of Jesus, you can do so by clicking the link below. I hope to see you soon. God bless.